This conference will now be recorded. All right, good morning, everyone, and welcome to our class on family history. In this class, we'll be talking about using our genealogy databases to conduct your family history research. My name is Keith Began. I'm the System Technology Trainer for the Mercer County Library System. In this class, I'll talk a little bit about um, some good steps to take to prepare for your research. We'll talk about the two databases we offer through the Mercer County Library System with your library card, which are Ancestry Library Edition and Heritage Quest. And then we'll go into those databases and I'll kind of do, give you, uh, provide an overview of these two databases in terms of how we can search them and the collections and uh, the collections of databases they offer in their systems. All right. So, um, before we even start talking about these two databases, family history research, as you may already know, can be a bit overwhelming. There's a lot of information out there, um, billions upon billions of records that can be searched and combed through, okay? So it's good to kind of prepare yourself before you even jump into one of these databases potentially, okay? So um, whenever, uh, depending on essentially where you're looking up how to conduct family research, there's always some standard tips that are given, one of which is to kind of start with what you know, or start from home, as they sometimes say. So when you begin your research, it's advisable to kind of work with family members. Just talk to your family members first, jot down names just to make sure you have their spellings, uh, the spellings of the names correct. Um, your family members might even know of misspellings that have happened over time, so you could jot those down. Sometimes names are anglicized. Your family members might know of how your aunt or uncle or grandfather's name was spelt once upon a time. You can jot that stuff down. Okay, so sometimes these immediate interviews are the best, best place to start before you jump into a website or a database like we'll be showing today. Okay, other sources of sort of that immediate research, okay, things you might have on hand, obituaries and memorial cards, memorial books, family papers, okay, just things you've accumulated over the years, family pictures, of course, okay, look at the backs of pictures, old letters and postcards, birth and wedding announcements, newspaper clippings, and cemeteries, all right, actual cemetery plots and tombstones. So again, just a good idea to kind of think about what you have on hand in terms of actual family members and then other uh, physical copies of things that you can might maybe consult before you jump into internet land, okay? <clears throat> all right, now, also it's important to organize your research, of course, because again, family research can be very overwhelming. There's a lot of stuff out there, so you need to keep yourself organized. All right, so you want a designated area to keep your research, that's always good. Have a specific desk or something where everything is kept. Okay, you don't wanna have a notepad downstairs and one upstairs, just have it all in one place. Okay, get some file folders potentially with some good plastic sheet protectors and pockets to keep track of hard copies. Put everything in, uh, organize things maybe by family member um, or by type, pictures in this one folder, uh, uh, postcards in this other one, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, develop some kind of logical system to keep those physical items in order. Okay, maybe keep them in chronological order, that might help you, okay. And then you wanna, it's always gonna have some kind of family tree record. Now, as we're going to see, um, we can't necessarily get a, keep a in real time family tree in these databases, but they do provide sheets that you can download and print that you can use to sort of handwrite and keep track of your research. And we'll go over those in just a second. Okay, so now that we're prepared, we've organized our area, we have our, maybe we have our folders ready. Now we wanna go and get onto the computer. So we're gonna be talking about two databases that we offer here through the library. Now there are a lot of great websites out there that are available just on the open internet many of which are give you information for free. All right, there's a lot of public domain information, things like uh, the National Archives, for example, the US Census Bureau. Um, but essentially what these databases do is they're taking all of that information from all of these different places, whether it's in the US or outside the US, and they're putting it onto one place. So it just makes it easier for you to get to everything from one location, okay? We call that an aggregate. It's just aggregating information 
and putting it into one place. So you don't have to consult 10 different websites when you could just do one. So we're gonna be talking about Ancestry Library Edition. All right, now this is free for Mercer County Library System card holders. However, as I mentioned, you can only access it when you're inside one of the MCLS branches. You cannot access from, uh, many of our databases can be accessed from home. You just have to plug in your library card number. This one, unfortunately, you must be in the building. And that's, and that's the case for other libraries as well, not just us. Okay, Ancestry Library Edition is licensed for in-library use only. Okay. Now, Ancestry Library Edition pulls from 8,000 plus domestic and international databases for a grand total of 8.9 billion and counting total records. Okay, now, one important thing to realize here, Ancestry Library Edition is not the same as Ancestry.com. Ancestry.com is a consumer website uh, which requires a paid subscription. So Ancestry Library contains most of the collections you're going to find in Ancestry.com. Okay, but one of the things it does not contain, perhaps most notably, is the family tree creation tool, which does come in handy. Um, it allows you, if you're an Ancestry.com subscriber, you can create your own family tree and add to it and edit it in real time as needed. So it's kind of like, um, it's basically just providing you that record keeping tool and host it on their website. Ancestry Library Edition, however, does not have that tool. Okay, but you can, first of all, view other family trees that have been made public, so you can at least read them as long as they're public. And as I mentioned before, you can download some good documents to yourself, handwrite, and keep track of your tree. So you can't do it on the website itself, but you can at least um, download some of these tools to help you. And we'll go over those in just a second. All right, so a number of collections, um, Ancestry Library Edition has a lot of different collections, as I mentioned. Okay, it's pulling from 8,000 plus databases. All right, the notable collections include city and area directories, immigration and travel databases, so things like passenger arrivals, naturalizations, border crossings, plus more. Maps, atlases, <clears throat> excuse me, and gazetteers, okay. Uh, military records, things like draft records, pension records, service records, and more. Newspapers, although mostly obituaries, okay, you, you will likely not find too many um, sort of full copies of newspapers from Ancestry Library Edition. They will mostly be obituaries pulled from newspapers. Okay, occasionally you might find a snippet or two, uh, but for the most part, you'll find obituaries that are pulled from newspapers. Okay, wills, probates, land, tax, and criminal records. All right, many of which come in handy for homing in on addresses, um, or right, a number of things. And then of course, vital records. All right, birth, marriage, and death records. All right, and what you're gonna find is that, so what do I have here? I have seven different uh, collections listed, essentially. Now, these are just sort of the general categories. What you're going to see is that within these categories, there are there are many upon many upon many specific collections. All right, different states, different uh, year ranges, different countries, uh, potentially. So again, these are kind of the categories that are given, but within those categories are a multitude of different collections that can be searched. Now, Heritage Quest is the other database we offer which, believe it or not, is essentially run by the same uh, vendor, which is ProQuest, and it's powered by Ancestry.com. So once we get to Heritage Quest in a little bit, you're going to see it looks pretty much identical to Ancestry Library Edition because it is associated with Ancestry, all right? It is a sort of uh, sister uh, database, if you will. Now, Heritage Quest Again, free for Mercer County Library System cardholders, and one big benefit, it can be accessed from home. All right. Now, this pulls from 500 plus domestic and international databases for a grand total of 5 billion plus total records. So, Heritage Quest has a lot of great information, a great place to start. It is not as comprehensive as Ancestry Library Edition. All right, but as you can see, still with 5 million plus total records, it still has a lot of information. Um, which can be 
uh, comb through. Okay, it contains many of the same collections as Ancestry Library Edition, though not necessarily as extensive. Believe it or not, Heritage Quest actually has some collections that are not in Ancestry, and these include books, things like family and local histories, kind of things that were put together ad hoc throughout different states in the country, all right, or different uh, counties, municipalities, perhaps. It also includes the Freedmen's Bank database, which is a great resource for finding information on enslaved people, okay? And also uh, the U.S. serial set, which is really something published by Congress. It's, um, it has records between for 200 years between 1769 and 1969, private relief actions, memorials, and petitions. I'm getting a sip of water one second and then we'll continue on. All right, so now that we've covered essentially what we're, now that we've sort of previewed what we're gonna see in these databases, I'm going to um, exit this uh, little PowerPoint here and make my way over to, oops, that's the wrong thing. Let's relaunch this. Sorry about that. Here we go. I'm going to go to our library website. So for those of you who are trying to follow along with me, that's um, in real time, that's fine. You can go ahead and launch your internet browser. All right. And give me one moment here and I'll be right back. All right, so our website is mcl.org, mcl.org, and this is, of course, the first stop to getting to our databases. Now, from our homepage, uh, we have the drop-downs here. I'm gonna go to resources. The resources uh, drop-down is a collection of all of our online databases, and they're all organized by subject, all right? We have the one right here, right under the tab itself, called Biography, Genealogy, and History. I'm gonna go ahead and click on that, which will take us to um, these types of databases, uh, biography, genealogy, and history. Now I'm going to scroll down the page. And our first stop is going to be Ancestry Library Edition. So again, for those of you attending virtually, um, assuming you're not here in the library, of course, or on one of our branches, um, this you will not be able to access from home but you can at the very least just watch for now. But like I said, when we, um, I'm gonna open up Heritage Quest as well. We'll kind of do a side by side and you'll see that it's very similar. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and click on go to the database here for Ancestry Library Edition. All right, now, um, what I'm going to do is, um, you don't have to do this right now. I'm gonna go back actually to our database list. And I'm gonna also open up Heritage Quest. So I'm gonna scroll down a little bit further to Heritage Quest and go ahead and click on this link to launch this database 
oops, and it should have opened in a separate tab. Excuse me one second. Let's try that again. Let's do it this way. There we go. Okay, so I have both open. And just to quickly show you on my screen. Okay, I have two tabs open in my browser right now. Ancestry Library up here and also Heritage Quest online. I'm gonna, this, right now I'm looking at Ancestry Library Edition. I'm gonna toggle over to Heritage Quest and you'll see, okay, it's a bit different, but it's actually very similar, okay? Um, the interfaces are very similar. And as we're gonna see shortly, this, the sort of search experience is also very similar. So if you learn on Heritage Quest at home, you should have no issue applying those same skills to Ancestry Library Edition here. All right, so let's start with Ancestry Library Edition. First of all, there's a, uh, a message right here. Let me just get out my pen for a second, my uh, online pen here. Okay, be the first to know when the 1950 census goes live. So as mentioned in the uh, post or the, uh, the description or advertisement for this class, we are upon the 1950 census. So a little thing about the federal census. The federal census is collected every 10 years on the zero, 1930, 1940, 1950, et cetera. The census is actually released um, to the public 72 years after, okay? There's a 72 year embargo. And that is why the 1950 census will now be released here in 2022. Now it has been released already on April 1st. It is available through the National Archives, archives.gov.gov. Um, it will be indexed in these databases. Um, they are saying by the summer is the best kind of estimate they're giving right now. So you can check back periodically to see if it has been indexed yet, all right? So eventually it will be indexed here. And as you are learning how to use these collections, the 1950 census will be available for searching. Again, it is available through the direct source, which is the National Archives, all right? But it, um, it will eventually be indexed in these third-party uh, websites and databases over time. And again, Ancestry is right now just telling its customers, expect it by the summer. All right, so it's good to learn these skills now so you can get ahead of it. And then when that 1950 census goes live on Ancestry Library and or Heritage Quest, you'll be ready to go. So the last, so the most recent census, federal census data available is 1940. All right. That's the that's the United States Census. Yes, the federal census. Yep. Okay. And there are some other census. There is census data available from other countries, but most of it, of course, is from the United States. Our federal census federal censuses, which is always a little difficult to say. So now, um, so I would like to start Ancestry Library. At the top here, we have a number of menu options where I'm circling with that red pen. All right, beginning with home and then search, message boards, learning center, charts and forms, new collections. Okay, so before we kind of dig into the searching, let me just erase that drawing. Um, I'd like to draw your attention to charts and forms. If you'd like to go ahead and click on charts and forms, go ahead. Okay, so as I mentioned, um, Ancestry Library Edition does not have a built-in family tree creation tool like the consumer website does for paid subscribers. However, they do give you these blank worksheets that you can print and use for your research. Okay, so for example, there's an ancestral chart. I'll click on it um, on my screen. You could just watch up front. Okay, so you can print this out as you can see. In fact, you can even, um, this one is actually a, um, an interactive PDF. So you can even type into it on your computer to keep track of a family tree. Okay, um, and you could print out multiple, of course, to kind of, if you need to, um, it, it, it's, it's kind of built to go as high as the great grandparents. Okay, but um, uh, if, yeah, presumably you can just then just keep going from there on your own, okay, without this particular worksheet, but at least this gives you a good place to start. Okay, now I'm gonna go uh, click on the, let me close this PDF to go back to 
the website here. Um, another really good one, so you'll see you'll see many here. Okay, a family group sheet. Um, I like the research extracts, which I'll show you real quick. Okay, as you're combing through these collections, um, again, it's even though it's organized nicely, it can still be overwhelming. You want to keep track of where you know what where you found this record, which can be a bit much. That I find it in vital statistics. That I find it in um, immigration. So this kind of helps you keep track of those things. Okay, so you can. Um, uh, as you comb through these records, you'll see some of these things like file numbers, call numbers, depending on the the uh, the record you are viewing. Okay, but at the very least, even if you don't keep track of those specific things, you could at least uh, jot down a description of the source. Okay, what you found there uh, under repository, you could potentially, or actually under index. I'm sorry, you could put uh, the collection it was found in. Okay. Um, and then a few other uh, pieces of information as needed. Okay, and also there's more lines down here for an even bigger description. Okay, so up above, you can just write down a few brief notes. Okay, um, this was an obituary from uh, 1902, right? And then down below, really get into the details of what you found out in that obituary, for example. Okay, so it just helps you keep track of where you found what record so that you can eventually if you need to go back to the database to look at them again you know where you found them so you don't have to guess or do a big um, long time consuming search or you can also just use this to again just have on hand so you can keep track of things in a sort of chronological or some other logical order all right i'm going to close this pdf and so again, these are just charts and forms you can download um, and print to keep track of your research. All right, now going back up to that main menu where we clicked on charts and forms, I also want you to now click on learning center to the left of that. Okay, so um, these are research aids. Um, Heritage Quest has something very similar. Um, here in Ancestry Library Edition, they call it the Learning Center, and we have some research aids here. This is also something good to consult kind of before you really start digging through the research, okay? Um, essentially, it's just a lot of great tips that you can consult uh, to have a better understanding of certain collections, um, and just, again, some tips to follow in order to optimize your research in terms of what you're looking for and to make the most of your time. So we have some get, getting started tips. All right, Ancestry Ann's top 10 search tips, for example, is here. Um, to the right of that, some tips for searching the census. Beyond the basics over here, using religious records, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, immigration, military, and ethnic as you keep scrolling. Okay, now one thing to keep in mind, every so often, it's kind of a, it's, it's, it's a bit of a, uh, just a little bit of an annoyance. Every so often you might hit something that's sort of a, uh, you might hit a roadblock. It doesn't happen too often, but it might be something that's only available on Ancestry.com. So you just wanna be, so if you hit something that says something like um, not found on this page, it's likely because somehow you ended up getting onto some kind of secret page that's only indexed on the consumer website. This happens with Ancestry Library Edition and Heritage Quest. Just something to keep in mind. Again, you probably won't encounter that too much, but every so often you might hit one of those blocks. Okay. So again, these are just good research aids, good, good uh, guides to consult before you start your research to make the most of your time. Also under the Learning Center up top here, we see a toggle with research aids and maps. Okay, you can click on maps if you'd like. All right, understanding the state your ancestor lived in will help you better understand them. Okay, so um, by clicking on a state from this map, okay, it's just gonna basically break down um, different types of records that are collected by that state. So you kind of understand what, um, 
so it's a state-specific look at the kinds of records that are indexed on Ancestry Library Edition. See, and in fact, this one is okay. So this wiki has been moved. Yeah. So as you're, uh, so as I mentioned before, um, these databases are kind of always in a in a state of flux. They're always being added to, updated. Sometimes, unfortunately, things get kind of moved around. Um, something that we can't really control. It's just the vendor is uh, has a handle on those things. So as I mentioned before, sometimes you'll hit these kind of walls that because something was moved or because it's only available on the consumer site. Okay, but um, as we can see here, um, yeah, so this wiki unfortunately was moved, it looks like. It's now brought to you by RootsWeb, okay. So it looks like they moved their wiki to rootsweb.com. I'm just looking really quick here to actually note that. Roots, yeah, uh, rootsweb.ancestry.com. Okay, but again, just descriptions of the different records you'll find, and it will redirect you where can you continue to the wiki so you can con click on that to get more information about those records. All right, it, so once upon a time, it took you directly there, now it just kind of reroutes you, but that's okay. It's still serving the same purpose, giving you more information about these state-specific records. All right, um, and down below, just a little description about sort of like uh, when the federal census started for that state, okay? Some information about surviving records, because some, um, again, there are a lot of things that happened throughout history. One county in New Jersey may have had a big fire in one of their courthouses, so this particular census is no longer available. So again, you'll find a lot of these great descriptions throughout, just to get more information on that, to, to give you a heads up. So if you're looking for something and you can't find it, why can I find um, the 1800 census? All right, for this particular county? Well, because perhaps there was some kind of uh, destruction of some kind, as it indicates right here. Okay, they were lost, destruct, uh, dis uh, destroyed by a fire maybe, things like that. So I'm gonna go to the top right, click on this X to close this pop out. If you wanna click, uh, if you notice the X up here, that will close that little image. All right, now um, going back up to the main menu, uh, let's click on message boards. Again, we're gonna get into the, the collections in just a second. I just wanna go over these kind of extra features in Ancestry Library. So the message boards here, um, these are kind of cool. So you can actually, it's an online genealogy community with over 25 million posts. So um, you are, able to basically post about a specific topic and connect with people that are researching maybe a specific person, a specific town, a specific community within that town. So as you can see um, where it says search the boards, you can type in a name or just a keyword like John Smith or Civil War. You can also look for a board, the name of the board about a specific topic. Again, you can search by maybe a last name or some other topic, okay? Um, you know, Lawrence, New Jersey, something like that. So something that's perhaps specific to a certain location, a uh, certain uh, county, community, it could be virtually anything, okay? And as you scroll down, you'll see, you can kind of browse by category as well, these different message boards. So again, just to see, it's just a good thing to kind of consult to see, has somebody researched this before so I can get information from them and connect with them? Okay, so if you try searching in uh, your family's name, perhaps you might find that other family members, okay, have already did, done some research and they're posting to this message board and now you, you, now you can connect with them.
All right, and this is just one example. I was just digging through for a second. You'll see um, in this particular example, I kind of drilled down to Alabama cemeteries and we have information on Winnie Josephine Baxley. Okay, authors listed here and, the, and, the, and when they posted it and then they have their, and if there are already replies are there. So if you click on it, the message board, you will see the actual message, of course. All right, and then you can even uh, print them out using the print icon here. And again, just to kind of see what other people are, um, if they're talking about the specific topic, so you can get a little more information. All right, so, um, so up to this point, we've kind of just talked about ways to keep track of your research with charts and forms. Uh, the Learning Center will help you prepare for specific collections, as we saw with those, the, those tips and tutorials. Also, the maps are available in the Learning Center to get to learn about some state specific um, records and then the message boards which allow you to kind of see what people have been posting about and potentially learn more about a specific person or place because you are researching the same exact thing. Now let's talk about the actual collections we're searching in Ancestry Library, Ancestry Library Edition. So again at the top there to the right go ahead and click on new collections which is kind of misleading the name and I'll talk I'll tell you why in just one second. All right. So this says new collections. But what it really is, I don't know why they call it new collections, they just do for some reason. It's a card catalog and it's a searchable listing of all record collections. So even though it says new collections, it's actually all their record collections in a big giant list. Okay. The reason they're calling it new collections basically is because you'll notice it's sorted by date updated. So all the newest stuff is at the top. So as you're scrolling down, it seems to have the appearance of the new quote unquote new collections. But as you keep scrolling, you'll eventually just hit all the other record collections, whether they're new, updated, or just, or not essentially. And of course you can change the way it's sorted. You can go by database title, date added, record count. Okay, and as you're looking at each of those uh, collections here, and notice how specific they are, 1950 United States Federal Census. So we're getting some records. Looks like we're some of them are getting in, uh, indexed. That's great. Okay, as because as I mentioned, this is brand new, so this is at the top of the list right now. So currently they are indexing the 1950 United States Federal Census. And if you look to the right, it tells you the kind of general collection name. Because as I mentioned, we have all these different categories within which these specific collections are indexed. Okay, and to the right of that, the number of records that are currently indexed in that collection. So right now from the 1950 census, we have um, over 3 million records indexed. Also next to that is the act under the activity indicator here, you'll see it says new. Okay, so when it says new, that means that that collection is just as it says, brand new. They just added it. We also get an indicator that says updated. This means that the collection has been, um, available for some time, but it's been recently updated. So they probably added some new records to it. Okay, so because like I said, these these databases are living and breathing. Okay, they're always on um, going kind of under development. Things are always being added to them. So it's just a good idea to kind of come here and see, first of all, you can get, you can actually literally see all the record collections that are available, but also just kind of see what's um, been recently added or updated. So you can, so periodically you can check back to say, oh, I'll look at this one again, because maybe last time this particular person wasn't indexed yet. Okay. And you could filter this list on the left. So if you only want to see the collections that are uh, part of birth, marriage, and uh, death records, okay, you can filter just by those, for example. You only want to see the collections that are part of the wills and probates collection, you can do that by clicking down here. All right. Um, you'll notice family trees. I should have mentioned this. Uh, uh, forgive me, I forgot. I mentioned that you can't build a family tree here in Ancestry Library Edition, but you can view public uh, trees. So on the consumer website, if a user makes their family tree public, you can at least read them from here. You can't add to them or interact with it, but you can at least read it. And again, those are um, those will be available um, through the filter. Okay, 
And as you can see, you can also search these collections in the top left. You can search by title and or keyword. Now, um, before we talk about searching, I'd actually like to go over to Heritage Quest first to kind of compare and contrast. And then we'll talk about searching these, these collections. Because of course, this helps. We see a big list of collections, but it's so overwhelming. We can't possibly sit through all these and decide which ones we want to go to. It's kind of, that'd be a very arduous task. So typically we just do a targeted search and then go from there. But before we talk about that targeted search, I'd like to go over to Heritage Quest. All right, so give me, um, my, so to my virtual students, give me one second, I'm gonna get set up and then I'll be right back. All right, so as I mentioned, I have, um, before what I did was I opened Heritage Quest in a separate tab in my browser, so I can just toggle back and forth as needed. Um, and I should mention too, um, so here's Heritage Quest. Once I clicked on the links from our website, it took me directly to these databases. Now that's because I am in the library right now, so I am already connected, it's already authenticated, my access. If you're doing it from home with Heritage Quest, you're gonna have to put in your library card number first, and then it will allow you to um, access the site. So just one little difference I should mention. Okay, so again, if you're doing it from home, you have to put in your library card first, and then you'll have access to Heritage Quest. Okay, so here's Heritage Quest. Here's the homepage for Heritage Quest. Um, if you look at the menu above, it has a similar look, but we only get two options, home and search. Because as I mentioned, Heritage Quest is not quite as comprehensive um, as Ancestry Library Edition in terms of its collections and in terms of its functionality. Okay. Um, let me just look here for one second. Okay, but go ahead and, actually, I'm sorry, from right here. It's from two places, I always forget. So if you look at this main uh, banner here where it says Heritage Quest Online, you will see search, research aids, and maps. So kind of like, Ancestry Library Edition, it does have that Learning Center material, it, but instead of calling it Learning Center, they just divvy it up between Research Aids and Maps. So if I click on Research Aids from Heritage Quest, all right, I get some of those same tips that we got from Ancestry Library, not as much necessarily, uh, but we do have a lot of good stuff here. So as I said, it's kind of like, um, for lack of a better phrase, it's sort of a watered down version of Ancestry Library Edition. Okay, that's kind of what you're finding here. Again, not to say that it's, um, inferior, but it's just, it's not quite as comprehensive, but it's still a great place to start, especially because you'll be accessing this one from home. So you could start from here and then move on to Ancestry Library later, should you want to. Uh, so those are the research aids. We also have maps, just like before. Um, one thing Heritage Quest does that I really like, um, and this isn't immediately available or immediately sort of visible on the Ancestry web uh, database, if I go to a state, it actually shows me territorial changes over time. And this is on Heritage Quest, okay? Because again, um, so a couple of things to remember when you're searching through your family history. First of all, names are often misspelled, so that's tricky. Also, territories change, boundaries change, um, counties are 
not existing in one uh, set of data, in one census, for example, but then uh, a decade later, now there's a new county. So we have to be kind of careful with the search terms. So in this case, this kind of helps us with those, the territorial and boundary changes. So for, for example, looking for information about our ancestors who we think lived in the Mercer County area in, in the 1830s, I can see there's actually no Mercer County back then. So they may have lived in Hunterdon, they may be listed as Burlington County residents, they may be Middlesex, okay? So um, it's just a good idea to, if you're looking, especially if you're going back into the 1800s and earlier, to kind of look at the state you're look, uh, you're researching and see if, um, if that location you're trying to associate with your family member even existed in the way we know it now. Okay, so you might just have to do a little bit of that research here before you start doing some targeted searches. And again, this is available by state. And on the left side, we see um, uh, the census years. Okay, because again, remember the census is collected every 10 years on the zero. And I believe, so, so this is 1790 through 1920. Yeah, so the, the date range for those territorial changes will vary depending on the state you're looking at. All right, now, um, let me go. Okay, so now that we covered those basics, let's actually go back to Ancestry Library and start talking about searching. So up in your tabs, click on the other tab that was Ancestry Library Edition. Okay, now I want you to go ahead at the top there Click on search in from the main menu above. All right, so when I click on search, I get this drop down menu. Okay, so from this search dropdown, essentially in Ancestry Library Edition, I can search by uh, category, okay, or collection as they call them. Census of voter lists, birth, marriage, and death records, military, immigration, and travel, and I can also just search the main card catalog like we see right now. Now, I can also click on all categories. So if you want to go ahead and click on all categories, go for it. All right, so Ancestry Library Edition allows you to do a global search, which means that you are able to search all of their collections at once, okay? Heritage Quest, as we're gonna see in a minute, you um, does not allow for global searching. You have to search by collection, okay? So you have to kind of narrow down that collection first and then you can run your search. Whereas in Ancestry, we can run a global search which searches across all collections for your search terms. All right. Um, again, and that's and that's done by just going to search and then clicking on all categories. Now, is a global search the best way to do your search? Not necessarily, because that can be a bit overwhelming. So even though Heritage Quest doesn't offer a global search function, it's not necessarily the worst thing in the world because usually you don't want to do a global search anyway, to tell you the truth, because you're just going to be searching so many collections that the results might be overwhelming. Um, so what I like to do, what I typically recommend, okay, or at least just in what I, in 
in sort of my personal experiences, I like to start with census uh, information because census data gives you a lot of stuff right off the bat, and it's typically very clear, um, and you get nice, often get nice transcriptions. So I find it helpful to start with census data and then kind of go on from there. All right. So what I'm going to do is on the right, you'll notice we see explore by collection here. And these are, again, all those different categories, birth, marriage, and death, census of voter list, et cetera, et cetera. Under census of voter list, I'm going to click on U.S. federal census collection. It's going to take you to back to the search screen, but when, this time we're only searching records from the U.S. federal census. And we're leaving out the other collections. Okay. Um, now we can, so we can run our advanced search here. We'll talk about that in a second. If you scroll down a bit, uh, these are all the data collections you're going to be searching. It's just kind of letting you know. So it's basically, the the U.S. federal census from 1790 through what's available in 1950 right now. Again, not all the 1950 census is indexed. I don't believe it is, so, but it's but it's up, you know, it's gonna let you search for what's uh, there now. And then some other um, schedules as well, uh, sort of related to the census, okay? And of course you could, if you want to, click on these to actually limit by a specific census as well. So if you only wanna look in the 1940 census, you could click on this and run your search. So in fact, let's all go down and click on the 1940 federal census. No, uh, that's a good question. So where it says free, um, it's it's that's a little tricky. Free, it actually means that that's freely available on the consumer ancestry.com website without a subscription. <laughs> so even though we're not on their website, they're just trying to let you know that this is freely available no matter what sort of website or database you're using, okay? Because again, a lot of this data is just public domain anyway, but there, but there is data that's owned by Ancestry.com, and that's typically the stuff that you're accessing as a paid subscriber, or here through the library edition. Okay. So here's the 1940 United States Federal Census. So, we, so you saw what we did there. We started with a global search. Then we narrowed it down to just the census, the U.S. Census. As you saw, there are other countries available. And then we narrowed it down to just 1940. Because we might be saying to ourselves, well, I know that so and so, um, you know, they may have bought their house in 1935 in the 1930s, so it should most likely be indexed in the 1940 United States Federal Census. Okay, so that brings us then to our search here. Okay, which of course you're typically going to be searching by name, so we have first and middle name and last name, and then you can fill in these fields as needed. Now, typically, um, it's usually advise that you try to start specific to home in on the on that specific person because especially if it's a last name that's kind of common you're going to be sifting through a lot of results okay so for example you could put in a last name and first name if known um, one that i often use is lived in okay maybe not birth year because birth years are often um inaccurate depending on the collection you're looking on the records you're looking at and also they'll also, um, sometimes they'll put about or approximate because they don't know exactly when they were born or even the person may not know when they were born. So it's just, a, it's an approximation, but lived in is something that's kind of, that was recorded in real time during the census. So that should at least be accurate. So when you go to lived in, as you can see, you can type in city, you can type in county, state, country. So you can get as specific or as broad as you need, okay? Um, and then if you know other people associated with that family member, you can indicate that here, father, mother, sibling, spouse, child. So again, if you know for sure that you're looking for this person and their wife's name was so-and-so, you could put that here and then it will limit your search results to only that match. So this person who is married to this person. So you're excluding anybody else with that same name who was not married to that person. So again, it's just a way of sort of being as specific as possible the first time around. And then if you're not finding the results you think you should be finding, then you start to kind of eliminate some of these uh, terms to broaden your search and locate the person you need. Okay, because sometimes we get too specific 
Um, because remember, the database, the records, um, the names, and the other information in those records is not necessarily what you think they should be. So you need to be careful when you're searching these things. Okay, because they weren't always transcribed correctly. Names were misspelled. Uh, birth years were, uh, were inaccurate. Okay, so we have to just be patient and broaden our search every so often and then look through the results to find the person we need. Okay, um, now another thing, again, before I run a search, down below, this is super helpful. Don't discount these, and you'll find this in Heritage Quest as well. You will find kind of information about the specific collection you're looking at. So it says about 1940 United States Federal Census. So if you're wondering, well, is the information I need gonna be in this collection? Oftentimes these descriptions will help you sort that out ahead of time. So it's gonna give you some historical background on that collection, but it's also down below gonna say what you may find in the records. And this I find is super helpful. So it's gonna tell you right off the bat what's most likely gonna be in the records. Again, you, it might not check all the boxes, but you'll find a lot of this stuff, most likely. Address, home value, whether owned, whether owned or rented, et cetera, et cetera. If we go to the 1930 census, you'll see that it actually tracked whether you owned a radio or not. That was part of the census data. All right, so you'll find these kind of funny little things that are sometimes unique to a specific uh, year in which that data was collected. All right, but again, um, before you run your search, you can just scroll down past the search, uh, the search fields and just see what is actually in this collection before I potentially waste my time searching it because maybe what I need is not going to be in here. All right, and again, the information is specific to that um, collection, 1940 census. So if there, again, if there was some kind of um, uh, fire in in uh, somewhere, it might indicate that for this census. So this particular, um, this enumeration district in this state, for example, um, we lost data for it. So you're not gonna find it in the 1940 census, okay? So consult these um, little descriptions for the collections, get an idea of what you're gonna find there even some interesting facts about that particular collection. Okay, Mary and John were the most common name, given names appearing in the 1940 census. So just a lot of cool stuff you'll find out through here. Okay, that might help you with your search. Uh, the top five foreign countries listed as a birthplace in the 1940 census were Italy, Germany, Russia, Poland, and England. Okay, so just to give you a sense of the sort of uh, where the majority of uh, immigrants of this country were coming from. All right, now I'm gonna scroll back up to the top. All right, now if you wanna run a sample search with me, you can, otherwise you could just watch up front. So um, I'm gonna look up the last name here, Costanza, okay, C-O-S-T-A-N-Z-A. -A. In the first of middle names, I'm gonna type in Constantine. Constantino, I believe. See, sometimes I can't even remember. Constantine, Constant. there we go, yes. C-O-N-S-T-A-N-T-I-N-O, Constantino Costanza. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and now click and run my search. I'm not gonna put in anything else just yet. I just wanna run a search and see what comes up. So here's my results. Uh, I'm gonna X out of this. I don't wanna do a survey right now, no thank you. Okay. So here's my results, and you can see um, it's gonna show you the name, or at least a, uh, a, a close match to that name on the right. Um, now, the results you get here, the data you're seeing here is going to vary depending on the collection, because remember, not all collections, uh, not all records collect the same types of data, okay? But in this particular collection for the 1940 census, I have a name of the uh, person I've searched for. I have, in this case, their parent or spouse, where they lived in 1940, it says Trenton, Mercer, New Jersey. Their birth year is approximately 1890. Their birthplace is Italy. Relation to head of house, they were the head of household. Okay, again, a lot of this terminology is kind of specific to that collection or the year in which it was collected. All right, head of household, um, all these kinds of things. Now, um, if I'm interested in that record, before I click on view record, take note of this as well. On the left side, 
where it says your search. Notice what it's doing. The last name, it's doing a broad search. Notice the level here. You can, it's a level of specificity. So by default, it's going to look for that last name or last names like it. So it might be a few letters off because remember, sometimes last names were either misspelled or they were changed over time, okay? Under that is the first name, and that one is a little more specific. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm doing that backwards. The, the first name is broad, the last name is a little more specific because the last name is really more unique, of course, so the database is gonna add a little more specificity to it. Whereas the first name, um, not necessarily quite as important to identifying that person, so they left that broad. Now you can adjust those as needed, so if you wanna look for it, that last name exactly as, as spelled, you could toggle this, click and drag it to exact. But you probably don't want to do that because again, you're going to be missing out on results that are um, potentially just misspellings or name changes. Okay. And if at any time you want to edit your search, you want to go back and maybe add some specificity or some search terms to it, you can use the, uh, the pencil icon here. which will just reopen this search box and you can add more fields if you want and then run it again, okay? Now I'm gonna click on view record next to this very first um, person listed. Now for the census, it's going to, be, it's going to give you um, a nice, essentially a transcription of what's on the actual record because sometimes the records are hard to read. So this is basically everything that's in this image here laid out in a table. So you could just read it um, clearly. All right, and it's giving me all types of information. And these are all the fields. These are all the fields that were uh, captured or tracked in the 1940 census. All right, and there are more as I scroll down. Now, if I wanna see the actual record, I can of course click on the image here. And with the census specifically, it's going to home in on that specific um, row of data in the, in the uh, census sheet. So what do you see in yellow there is Constantine Casanza. What you see in green are relatives, okay? Now, once you are looking at the actual primary document, okay, and Heritage Quest has these same tools. First of all, down below, there's this little uh, toolbar here where we see seven of 42. That means we're on page seven of 42. If you click on this little icon, it has the little silhouette, that will bring up that transcription again underneath. So you can view the transcription and the primary document kind of side by side. So notice what's in yellow down below. That's the same exact record as what's up here on the primary document. Okay, so I can just, so it's much easier to read, but this allows me to kind of look at it back and forth. And again, don't, don't just assume that you should only look at the transcription because transcriptions are sometimes inaccurate. If you look at the way something is written, you might actually say, you know, I think it's actually, um, I think that's a, an A, not an O, for example. Okay, whoever transcribed it may have made a mistake when they created the record we're seeing at the bottom. That's why it's so important to look at these things. So the person who jotted their name down in the first place may have made a mistake, or the person who transcribed this record for the database may have made a mistake. So you want to be, so it's always good to kind of look at both. Look at the primary document and then look at how it was transcribed. All right, now also on the right side, there's this toolbar here. It's a bit hard to see because it's kind of that black background, but there is a zoom feature. You can zoom in and zoom out. All right, so there's all their children. I see daughter, 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 son, okay. And then all their related data. As you, and then of course you could scroll to the right just click and drag or scroll up and down as needed, okay? Um, another helpful feature in that toolbar on the right, just to point this one out, if you click on the wrench icon, uh, you can rotate the image, which probably you don't need to do very often. Um, under settings, you can change what's being highlighted and what's not being highlighted. Also the invert colors tool. This is good for accessibility, okay? If, um, some people see better on a, white font on a dark background. So if you invert the colors, it's kind of like a dark theme or dark mode. You can read it this way as well. That's easier. 
again, Heritage Quest has the same um, features. Same interface, same layout of the toolbars, same uh, search functions to enhance your search. And I'll click on Invert Color again to put it back the way it was. All right, now in the top left is an X. I'm gonna click on that X to close out of this specific record that we're looking at and just go back to the, um, the search result page. And I'm actually going to, let me see, is it available from here? No, oh, so from this page as well. So this gives you access to the record, of course, but perhaps more importantly, or equally as important, if you scroll down, first of all, you'll see links to other relatives. So these serve as direct links to their information in that collection, in the 1940 census in this case, okay? So you don't have to go and back and search again for another person. You don't have to run a whole different search. It just collects them and it links you right to their records by name, okay? On the right side, this is also very important. Don't discount this, suggested records. So remember before we are talking about, there's so many records, how do we know possibly know where to start? Well, by searching one record and finding a, a match, we'll call it, it's gonna show you suggested records that most likely are um, in some way related to that same person. So now I can find information about them in uh, Find a Grave Index. I can find information about them in the 1920 census. I can find information about them in city directories. Okay, so it's just going to uh, link you to other uh, records that match that person. Okay, and again, they might not always be the exact same person, but it's pretty sophisticated and they often are actual matches because they're looking at not just their name, but also their where they lived, all that kind of data to give you a match with other records. All right, so again, essentially we just, when we ran our search, we narrowed it down to a specific census. I like to start with the census because as you can see, it gives you a lot of different data to work with. And then from there, if you want to read the primary document, you can. Also, you can scroll down to go to other suggested records. And then from here, we just start branching out, right? And getting more information about that person potentially. And then information about maybe their relatives, okay? Because depending on how far back we go, now we might see who their parents were. We get their parents' name and we just keep going and going. All right, now I'm going to go, I'm gonna go to my internet, uh, my browser back button and go back one page. Actually, let me see. I want to see something really quick here. I'm going back. Okay. I just want to show you one thing. You can just look on my screen. Um, so I'm back on the 1940 data. Okay. So these are um, the children here. Ray, Angelina, Anna, for example. If I go to the 1930 census, let's go to that one under suggested records. you're gonna see different spellings. Constance, I'm gonna pronounce that Raphael. Okay, Angelina spelled differently. So again, in this case, it uh, looks like their names at some point were, we'll call that anglicized. So these are likely their birth names, but they changed them later. When they um, became, when the parents became naturalized citizens potentially, and then they changed their names. So again, just to show you that depending on the record you're looking at, their names might be different. Okay, and the, the last name spelling, it could be the way it was originally spelled. I'm not sure about that. Um, I would have to maybe consult someone who knows a lot about the way things were spelled in Italy. I'm not really sure to tell you the truth, but uh, that, that could be a spelling error or it could be the way it was actually spelled. I'm not sure. But again, by sort of relying on the system of linking records, we kind of are able to get around that problem of having to come up with different spellings because the, the database itself is pretty good at finding matches, even if it's not spelled the same way. Oh, and you know what, one more thing I should have um, 
So as I mentioned, we can't save directly to a family tree like we can with Ancestry.com. But in addition to those worksheets you can print out, you'll see a print button. So you can print the record you see here. Okay, so you could at least print it out. Um, and if we go to the actual primary document, give this a second to load. In the top right, you'll see save. So I can send this image, um, send image home. I can actually send it to an email address. I can also save it to this computer as an image. Okay, so though I can't build a family tree and store that family tree on this database, I can at least save individual records basically to my computer or email them to somebody. Okay, so it's just another way of keeping track, just kind of being able to organize your primary documents as you do your research. And, and as I mentioned before, the, the highlighting feature is not, you're not gonna find that in all record collections. All right, um, we see that with the census, there may be others. A lot of them though, you'll have to just kind of um, find it, find the name on your own a little bit. It takes a little bit of digging. All right, now uh, let me click on the X here to close that. Now up in my internet browser, I'm gonna go back over to Heritage Quest. If you'd like to click on the Heritage Quest tab, you can. Okay, so as I mentioned, Heritage Quest does not allow for a global search. I can't search all collections at once, but we don't typically want to do that anyway because it's just going to be, the results will be a bit too overwhelming. So to search Heritage Quest, you could start by clicking on search in the main menu. So go ahead and do that. All right. And as you can see, I have to start from a specific collection before I can run my search. Okay. So we have the census again. These are those local um, family history books. That may be that you so you might find some interesting information depending on location. This is only in Heritage Quest. Wills and probates, we have these in Ancestry as well. Uh, city directories, these are also in Ancestry. Military records, all right. Um, military records and heritage are not quite as extensive. For example, um, uh, Ancestry has uh, draft cards, okay, which I believe Heritage Quest does not, but. They do have, um, Heritage Quest does have a nice Revolutionary War database. So if you're looking that far back, um, I believe this is actually only stored in Heritage Quest. Let me just see really quick if that's actually in Ancestry. I'm curious. We have land grants, but these are the actual, yeah, so what's in Heritage Quest, for Revolutionary War or the War Pension and Bounty Land Warrant application files. So this is a very specific collection to basically pensions from the Revolutionary War. All right, whether it was um, given to the person who served or to perhaps their spouse. All right, I just wanted to see, uh, let me go back though to the previous page. Okay, so, um, and then as you keep scrolling, you'll see more records you can search. Okay, and there's Freedmen's Bank. Like I said, this is unique to Heritage Quest. This will search uh, for your African American ancestors in the Freedmen's Bank of Records, which was formerly called the Freedmen's uh, Trust and Savings Company. Okay, 1865 to 1874, and then also the U.S. Serial Set. This is also unique to Heritage Quest. And then we have just general public records. Now, if you're looking for someone um, that was basically born after um, the uh, 1950, all right, um, you're likely, it might be a little hard to find, okay, if you're trying to start with someone more recent, but you can try the public records here, and it just kind of kind of come comb through a number of different public domain records, and it, the, it, the data given might be a bit limited, but it will find it. Um, I've done this before, and I found people that, you know, were born um, 80s, 90s, etc. Okay, and also the, um, I should mention, if I can find it here, 
it's probably, I'm looking for the mortality schedules. It's probably listed under, um, let me go back to the main page. Let me see if I can find it from here. Okay, so from the main page, there are mortality schedules. Um, Federal Census mortality schedules, 1850 to 1885. All right. Um, I'm just looking real quick here. Yeah, so basically um, when you're looking for, if you're looking for um, um, a, an ancestor perhaps that was, that passed away um, back in this uh, sort of year uh, range, 1850, 1885. Um, so it's kind of, this would have happened before the federal census got kind of standardized in terms of the data they were collecting. So you might have to look at the mortality schedule. It won't be available um, in the general census collection once you get to these years. All right, because in, in other words, that they basically used to use something different to track um, uh, those who have passed away, okay, the deceased names, and those were in the mortality schedules. And then once you got into, I believe 1890 and on, it just became um, sort of a field in the general census data or in, I'm sorry, not in census data, but in vital statistics. Before vital statistics became a, a standardized way of collecting data, birth, death, marriages. All right, and one more thing to just note quickly in Heritage Quest here is that you can browse these collections, okay? Um, so if you're trying to see, you might find, for example, um, you're looking for, let me go back actually to the main search. Let's go to the census. Let's go to 19, uh, we'll go to 1930. All right, I can browse the 1930 census instead of looking for a specific person. Again, if I, if, if I, if I feel like they should have been in a 1930 census in this particular town, in this state, but I can't find them, I could at least browse that specific enumeration district to see if maybe their name was misspelled and that's why I'm not finding it. Okay, so I can actually home in on, in the 1930 census, I can go to uh, New Jersey, the county, I can go to Mercer, I could choose a specific city, Trenton, and then I would have to, um, in most cases, um, Unfortunately, there's no browse all for the districts. I wish there was, but you'll have to know the ward or district that they were part of when they collected the data. All right. Um, I don't think I saw that pulled up here, but as you get, but then you would just narrow them down by district, and then you could search the entire uh, schedule for that specific district again in that county in that state to see if you can find that person. Okay, unfortunately, there's no search mechanism for searching the primary document, but you just have to zoom in and just kind of scroll down. Okay, and just, uh, and also you might find neighbors, you're trying to find information on the person that lived next door to them, okay, or um, other family members that lived in the same neighborhood. So you'll likely find all that here as you scroll through. All right, so um, if you guys, if anybody has any more questions about what we covered in these databases, um, I know there's a lot, there's so much information here. It's going to take me, of course, all week, all month to really comb through everything that's found in these databases. But what's important to realize, um, the big takeaway here is that it's best to first use some of those, re, uh, those tools that Ancestry gives you to print out potentially those worksheets or just create something your own if you want to, okay? Get yourself organized. 
And then once you're organized and you have those worksheets ready potentially, then you can start doing your search. But when you run your search, all right, you can do a global search, but you're probably better off just limiting it to a specific collection first. And you could start with census, because like I said, that's going to give you a lot of data right off the bat that's easy to read, and then maybe move on to immigration and travel, or just really any of those suggested records we saw before. Okay, once you get to that record, you can see the suggested records down at the bottom right, and just move on from there. And again, just keep track of where you found what, that research extract here in the Learning Center was very helpful for that particular reason. So in case you want to look at it again later, you know exactly where you found it. Okay. So should you have any more questions, for those of you attending virtually, you can um, submit them to the GoToMeeting chat. Uh, we do have an open lab later today as well at 2 o'clock. So if you want to sign up for that, you can kind of come into the library, into the lab here, and work on this today if you want to, or really anything else you want to work on. Uh, I'm just going to leave up this slide here. All right, it might be a little hard to read. I apologize for that. Um, these are just some other good websites to consult. Now, um, I also have a handout of these. So for my virtual students, I will be sending you links to two handouts, all right? One of which is databases and websites, many of which are available on the open web for free. And another handout that's a sort of nice comparison chart between Heritage Quest and Ancestry, kind of like what we talked about today, but in more detail. These specific collections you're gonna find in each. Okay, um, and just to point out a couple of these websites real quick, Cindy's List it is basically an aggregate as well. It just compiles different genealogy sites, all right, because if you start searching on the internet, you'll also find a lot of great sites for, for example, if you're looking for specifically um, Polish ancestry, something like that, there might be a site from Poland that will help you kind of research that data there, that you may not find in one of these databases, okay? Um, so Cindy's list will kind of compile that list of sites for you. And also Family Search. Believe it or not, Family Search is basically the data collected is this is collected by the same people who collect the data for Ancestry and Heritage Quest. All right. Um, but Family Search is free to use. You just have to make an account and then you can start saving your research on familysearch.org. Okay, so um, again, should you have any more questions, please send them my way. If you're all set for the day, um, you're welcome to just click on the X at the top of the GoToMeeting window and then select Leave Meeting. Again, this class was recorded. It will be on our library's YouTube channel on our computer instruction playlist. All right, to get there, just go to our website uh, and then make our way to our YouTube channel by clicking on the YouTube icon at the top of the home page, and then you'll go to the computer instruction playlist. Again, go to our website, mcl.org. At the top of the page, you'll see the YouTube icon. You'll see all of our social media icons. Click on the YouTube one. Once you're on our YouTube channel, go to playlist and then go to the computer instruction playlist. Okay, and that this video will be posted there um, sometime over the next couple of days. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and stop the recording. I'll, I'll stick around for a few minutes if you have any questions. I'll be turning off my microphone and camera, but I will still be here. All right, so again, thanks for coming, and we hope to see you again in class very soon. Take care.